Thank you, Isabel. We, we, uh, we have a great group here, despite the fact we don't have Hillary. We have, a, I think, the DIY maker movement well represented. I think what I'd love to do is a little bit of context first to give a sense about um, the DIY and the maker movement and, and how they're making places with it, how, what people imagine it being in, in the world, how it's bringing art, to art and technology together, and then uh, all the physical kinds of things that are happening. So. Uh, so you know, one of the things I was inspired about by the lightning talks is how fierce the folks were. And I think that's one of the things, um, kind of common thread to DIY folks in general, is we just get things done so we can do more things. And it's not about getting something done and polishing it, but doing, 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 done, 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 done. Um, so I was, think, I was kind of like going like, whoa, these people have done a lot. So I started like scribbling down, what have I done? And it turns out if you do things and you just keep doing things, you end up doing a lot over time. And you can actually, no matter what it is you're doing, you basically win if you just don't stop. So like, um, so I did, I was in, I did Sama, I was in a Sama band, Gamelon band, did puppetry, worked with Creature Shop, uh, was a teacher, taught, first and second grade, learned how to hand, do my own handwriting again, because it was wrong. And <laughs> then uh, accidentally became an art teacher, became an artist, tried to be, actually sell art, failed um, after doing a bunch of that, made a bunch of video art, failed, published all that stuff to the internet, won, um, and then made a bunch of videos, uh, got basically sponsorship for those videos with Make Magazine to make something new every week. Then ended up moving to New York, needed a, play, needed a group of people to nerd out with, created NYC Resistor so I could make anything with a bunch of smart people. Uh, with those folks, uh, with a couple friends from there, made MakerBot because we needed a 3D printer, couldn't afford one, made MakerBot, uh, made an absurd amount of stuff on the MakerBot and then empowered an entire generation to like do stupid, wonderful, and sometimes relevant things in three, <laughs> three dimensions. And then also managed, because we needed one, we created a, a sort of like a place where you could just put all that stuff um, on Thingiverse. And, uh, and now we're just, I've actually got like 45 different projects that kind of sprung out of there that are all getting pushed that will be dropping on the world over the next year. So Bree, talk about the, um, this one's even working now. I guess we'll share a mic. This is sure. perfect, right? This is a sharing economy. Um, so, so talk about the, um, the pace of change. You know, you talk about sort of ever accelerating. We certainly saw that with everyone's work in the, um, uh, in the lightning talks. But when you think about things that were not possible two years ago, um, things that are possible now, things that will be possible two years from now, I'd love to hear a little bit about that. And then I know you're, both of you are deep into that. So, but uh, if you jump in on that a little bit. You know, it's there's a lot. It's that's fun to be on the that's fun to be on the edge of stuff. To be like nobody's done this. I'm doing it, and then you get to be like, I'm going to do it just a little bit differently, so it's just a little bit cooler. <laughs> um, I, it, but you know, I was thinking actually, like one of my obsessions is actually megalithic monuments, things that were built more than five thousand years ago. My family has a about seventy five acres that we're restoring to old growth over a thousand years, which is kind of a long project, and we're also building megalithic monuments on it. And it's kind of weird because nobody really builds stone circles and chambered cairns and dolmens, but we do and we're kind of obsessed. And you're kind of getting into, getting into the, like one of the weird things is like, even if you're into, like whatever it is you're into is just, you just go deeper, deeper, deeper and the world kind of emerges from that like being interesting. So I'm not sure what your question was, but that's I what I was thinking. Time frame. <laughs> right, right. Oh, so. It's never been a better time to be a creative person in the entire universe because there's just, as you saw, like with with hype, is there's there's all sorts of inf infrastructure for people to be creative, and um, and so and the tools are there, the electronics are there. Seeing the the iLuminate folks, like you, uh, you can do all those things, but you should do it differently so you're not copying them, and so it's special to you. Got you. Okay, so we're not going to deal with the two years from now. <laughs> Okay, more. it's all right. Right, more. Okay, you want more of that. Um, Kagan, you've got, you started with Shapeway. Talk a little bit about, about your journey. I was sort of the, the idea of creation stories, sort of where, where you are now and how you got there. A bit. I'd love to hear that. Sure, sure. And maybe also a little bit two years from now. Um, I'd love that, too. Two so, years ago, two years from now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it, it's interesting for me. And first off, uh, you know, to listen to all of you guys speak. And I, I also, like Bria, was sitting down there. And I was like, oh, my God. And I was like, what have I done? I was like, what, have have I, <laughs> what have I done? Have I done anything? What Not do I have enough. to tell these people? Um, it, it's funny because I often joke that I used to be an artist. Um, I came to New York to be an artist. And then somewhere along the line, I started painting. And then I realized I was bad at painting. And then I started making things. And then I realized I was bad at making 
making things. And then I realized computers could make things. I was like, hey, that's awesome. Let's have computers make things because then I don't have to be good at it. Um, and that's how I got into 3D printing. Um, I, I actually am wearing the first thing I ever 3D printed, um, which was, I think, back in, in 2006 or 2007 when my friend, uh, he was like, you know, there's these, these uh, printers and they can make these objects for you and you just have to make it in CAD and then send it to me and I'll help you out. And I was like, that's amazing. Um, and it, it really changed my, uh, changed my world. Um, and then I think shortly thereafter, I started a company um, and I had that company for four years where I, uh, I took it even further and I said, okay, I love making things. Let's mass manufacture things. It is really hard mass manufacturing things um, as a person straight out of school that, you know, wants to change the world and wants to make amazing things and realize this is it's really, really expensive. Design Glut, yes, and Design Glut is actually where I first met Brie um, back in the day um, when when I was going through this process of like overseas manufacturing, um, and I was thinking how hard it was, and I was seeing that we weren't getting the kind of traction, and we were approached by uh, by AOL, and AOL was like, hey, you know, we've got these other company, you know, MakerBot, and we want you to do a piece with them where you're actually gonna like do a design in a day, and like you're gonna like 3D print something and design it, and we're gonna come and we're gonna shoot it all, and it's gonna be amazing. Um, and I remember going over to to this space on Bridge Street and uh, and meeting Brie and you know, printing this thing out on like the very first iteration of a MakerBot and thinking, this is gonna change the world. Um, this is the answer to literally like the past four years of like struggling with overseas manufacturing and not having enough upfront capital and not being able to like make small run production and not being able to like honestly like be a designer that wants to make things because making physical things is so hard. Um, you know, you look at the rate that our physical world has increased and then you look at the rate that our digital world has increased and you realize that they haven't gone at the same rate and the reason is because the barriers to entry are just so high. Um, so I saw that and I saw 3D printing and I was like, this is the future. I'm like done with this mass manufacturing thing, you know, let's get on the 3D printing bandwagon. Um, and now, you know, it's interesting, you know, flash forward, I think uh, four years again, um, you know, and I, I built a factory um, and I got a lot of experience 3D printing and now I'm back on the mass manufacturing bandwagon, um, but doing it with 3D printing and, and answering the question of custom mass manufacturing and how do we make, you know, millions of units um, that optimize and use this technology and are, and are almost identical, but not quite because they're completely custom customized for us. Um, and when I look at the, the future, you know, two years from now, to go back to, you, to your question, um, versus, you know, where we were, you know, six years ago, that's, that's where I see it going. Um, and that's what I hope and I want um, and I want to build um, in the future is the ability to, to make customized production, like, in a really big way. And not in a, like, hey, you know, let's, like, make a few things, but, like, let's make a million things um, and let's use this technology to do it. So you're talking about mass customization. Then, Ma mass point. customization. Absolutely. And vertical is yep. what you're working on. Absolutely. Why don't you talk a little bit about what you're doing right this moment. Sure, about sure. The, the company. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Company, so I've got this company. Um, no, I uh, so I was at Shapeways until uh, till last May. Um, I, as I mentioned, so I, I built out the factory there and really like got hands-on experience. And you know, how do we use these really, really awesome machines to, to mass produce things? Um, saw that and saw all these people making really cool things. And I was like, oh, I want to make things again. Like now, all I do is spreadsheets, and I'm tired of doing spreadsheets. And I thought, well, what do I want to make? Um, and started looking at the world around us. And there was this company Invisalign that I was obsessed with. And then I thought, hey, you know, let's make the Invisalign line for feet. Um, you know, we all wear shoes that are mass manufactured, but we should wear ones that are customized. And I thought, well, everybody likes different shoes and I'm not going to start a brand. So let's start a, an orthotics and insoles company. Um, and let's basically, you know, give everybody the, the ability to customize, you know, your shoes um, with 3D printing. So left Shapeways back in May, have been working on that since then. Um, we have a team of five now, so we're steadily growing. We're launching in, uh, in February um, and, and really um, building what I want to be and what I think of as, as the first real custom mass manufactured product leveraging uh, leveraging the technology. So that's pretty awesome. Wonderful, excellent. Gabriella, your turn now. Give us a little bit of it. You've done, we got to see your great talk, but um, particularly about the uh, DIY and some leveraging other people's code and some of this I think would be particularly interesting. Okay, um, so yeah, I guess uh, to answer that, I should give a little bit of background about myself and how I got to where I got because it wasn't from a typical background of being a computer scientist or engineer that allowed me to build the things I do. Um, and I guess as Isabel mentioned before, I, was, I came from a background of both classical piano and biology and those were sort of my two trajectories that I was having this hard time deciding between in about 2004. And uh, everyone said to me, if you could do anything but classical piano, don't do classical piano. And <laughs> it, it was a really, really hard decision because I had sort of envisioned myself as doing that 
professionally. Anyway, I gave that up and sort of was head headstrong in uh, sort of a lab setting, doing biology, also field research on snakes. And but anyway, I ended up doing cancer research. Eventually, I started to get really bored, and it, it felt like it didn't have enough impact. It was small steps over and over and over. And I yeah lost interest and wanted to do something hands-on, but also wanted to replace that creativity that had come from the piano. So what I started working with different electronics and kinetic sculptures and sort of didn't know how I could work technically and creatively, but then I actually I took a class at NYC Resistor when it was first starting, <laughs> and I, I didn't really know what Arduino was, but we were turning lights on and off with relays. So I was like, something's coming naturally, something seems cool, this is awesome, um, I'm not sure what it is. And then I just kept working, and I realized that I could work very technically by using these tools, these libraries, these kits that I could build upon and I just continue to be patient, work harder, and then I eventually went to ITP and was really able to enhance my skills by sort of studying there and giving myself the time to do that. So really working with open tools and toolkits and building upon source, uh, source code and other people's libraries allowed me to start to put together all these tools that were already out there. And when you, you're talking about this, everything sort of comes back to this idea of, of a place where these things happen to in this collaborative, the way in which people can collaborate and whether you're getting it off of building off of, of GitHub or Thingiverse or NYC Resistor. Bree, talk a little bit about the importance of bringing people together and sort of having a, a ground zero, if you will, or some way for people to come together and understand in the sense we talked about, about places like RISD being a, you know, a, a source of a school, but this is a post school, but this is important in this creation process, no? I mean, I think I totally wanted, I, I totally wanted to go to RISD or ITP. Right. Um, <laughs> <Me too. laughs> and yeah, and, uh, and you know, I would have gone here or the new school. I would have, I would have loved to gone to one of these schools, but I was kind of old and I was like, <laughs> I couldn't afford it because I was broke, and um, so I was like, dang, how's this going to work? And uh, it turns out that one of the secrets, and I'm just going to, um, so my partner Keo Stark just wrote a book called Don't Go Back to School, which is about if you're not going to go back to school, how to do it yourself, which it turns out the main thing about doing it yourself is to not do it yourself. Um, it's doing it with other people, or doing it yourself with other people, or doing it yourself with other people nearby. Um, so, uh, you know, so NYC Resistor, and actually you can come any Thursday night is open, and you come to 87 Third Ave and um, kind of social engineer your way in, uh, and we're on the fourth floor, and you can just geek out with a bunch of other geeks. And, or actually it's not even, I think like we've actually gotten to the place where nerds and geeks just are way more normal than everyone else, so it's just, a place for everyone, I guess, um, but the, or people who like to do things. That's probably the biggest subset. It turns out that if you are somebody who does stuff relentlessly, you are in like you're like the top one percent of the people in the world who actually do things <laughs> at all, because because most people are 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 uh, good word for it um, are are not relentless. They like to grill salmon and kayak and stuff like this. <laughs> And that takes a lot of time. So um, if you're one of the people who, you know, ha like one of the things for me is that I, I started working in the film industry right away and I didn't know any better. And so I got used to working 16 hour days, seven day weeks, and then drinking a lot. And, and um, when you do this, you realize like you can actually like brute force things into the world. Like you have a huge advantage over people. Like most people like go to work at nine, take like an hour lunch where they relax and then they like go home at five or six and watch TV. Like everyone here, no doubt. And right? it's just it's like, you can just the brutalize yeah. these people in the marketplace and there's enough of them that like, if you just do things, you're like automatically employable and have like, <laughs> and, ha and, and have like way more momentum. So I think the, the powerful thing about getting together with other people is, a lot of us who do things are totally lonely because there's not very many of us. And so if you can get a couple of them in the room, a couple of them in the room, particularly in New York City, is the best place in the universe for this. Because in most places, you go someplace, you go, let's do something. It's pulling teeth to get stuff done. But you come to New York and you're like, let's do stuff. And you know, the person next to you is like, oh, let's set it on fire. And then you're like, awesome. Traction. Something changed. Moving. So I think that there's that. Do you find that in New York that like Absolutely, get stuff yeah. done kind of thing? Well, Gabrielle, you just came from a place. You were on a boat for three months. We're talking about placemaking. What were you doing on a boat? <laughs> yeah. 
Um, <laughs> hold, it, hold it close. <laughs> okay. Um, I, what I was should I show the presentation in order? Okay. Absolutely. In order, first, I could show that, and then I could tell you what I was doing on a boat because this doesn't show what I was doing on a boat, but it shows the context of why I was on a boat, and some other boats as well. So. Um, <laughs> I've been working on a project uh, for a few years now, and the project is called Prote, and it's a project and a business. Um, it started a few years ago as sort of a, a conceptual project and an art project and just a platform for people to collaborate. But what it is, Prote, it's a shape-shifting sailing robot, and it's an open hardware project. It was originally developed to carry a heavy payload behind the boat, an oil-absorbent tail to enable local communities to take a hands-on approach to oil spill cleanup. But now it's expanded into this platform for modular, a modular platform for all types of ocean sensing. So it was started in 2010 by the founder, Cesar Harada, during the BP oil spill. And he was working with fishermen and saw the condition in which they were working and wanted to make a platform for people to use. So it, it is since then, he started publishing his work online and making prototypes. That's him, right That's him right there. <laughs> and, and then it turned into this global community of people communicating on Skype, wanting to help make this technology for an ocean solution that could clean the water with wind power. And then in 2011, I went out to Rotterdam and we converted this empty workspace into a workshop, a giant workshop where there were biologists, uh, scientists, engineers, artists, designers, and we were all collaborating to build the sixth prototype that you see here, and it was the biggest that we'd built. So it was this robot sailboat that had a lot of problems at the time, and, but we kept working on it, and we documented the work in a 100-page handbook that's uh, available in print and online that was made for other people to use and modify. But uh, recently, we went around the world, and um, did one you thing... Go, did you get the boat to go around the world? We that's made... <laughs> the bo three boats went okay. around the world. Um, well, like the canal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so we were making, uh, okay, so I'll finish and then I'll tell you the content. The uh, one thing we did was uh, me measure radioactivity with a company called Safecast who develops open Geiger counters mm -hmm. and they're based in Tokyo, so we uh, worked with them to waterproof some Geiger counters with the boats that we were bringing around the world on a big boat. And the cost of those is like like a one one hundredth of a Geiger counter, is it not? I mean, that's yeah, well, less, yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah, it's just made with solution, Arduino yeah. and other yeah. stuff, yeah. So anyway, so Protase expanded into other platforms and the communities continued to build new platforms for ocean sensing. So I guess why I was on a boat, we were accepted to be on an accelerator program <laughs> that was called... Oh, we got on that boat. We got yes. on that boat. So that boat was, it was an accelerator called the Unreasonable Institute, which was a partnership with the D School based in, in Stanford and an, a partnership also with Semester at Sea. So there were 600 undergrads, mostly American. There were about uh, 10 groups of entrepreneurs, either two or three, so about 20 entrepreneurs. And a lot of mentors would come on the boat at different ports. And we went from San Diego west to Hawaii, Japan, China, uh, Singapore, India, and then around Africa. And at each place we were stopping and doing uh, pitch events, doing workshops, with the communities, doing uh, a lot of field testing. And so we had this, so since we were making a boat, it was really relevant because we were making a boat that we wanted to sense global data. So on we had on a boat, on a boat. so <laughs> we, we had, I mean, we brought sensors and we also set up this workshop in the bottom of the big boat on the second floor, which is pretty much the lowest place. And the captains hated us and we were <laughs> creating this resin smell and we got into a lot of fights and... <laughs> I uh, had to have some interventions, but we, we built three prototypes. <laughs> we tested them in places like Barcelona, Japan, uh, Vietnam, and we're, we're also bringing this Geiger counter around the world, so we were, for the first time, getting global data. So uh, that, that's sort of the context of what we were doing, really being mentored, working with communities, seeing where Prote fits into the market and in different markets uh, on a global scale. Absolutely, so this whole point of community that there's no way you can do it without actually creating and, and the maker movement is critical, the community is, yeah? Yeah. So, so paint a picture of what this might look like as, a, as an economic driver. I mean, I, I, I think that, I mean, um, so I had a company that where I wanted a tool, we made one and then we made one for other people and we really shipped prototypes for a few years until we actually were able to 
now we ship a legitimate product that like FCC, ULC, all that kind of stuff, like cra crazy, <laughs> crazy legit. Like I've, we've got a factory, I've got a freaking factory that ha is like gonna be 100,000 square feet in Sunset Park. Nice. And, um, and we make stuff like on a like epic scale, like trucks line up, it's awesome. Um, but <laughs> it's, it, it's its own set of headaches. I mean, I think whenever you get a group of people together, you have to figure out how to work together and that requires like respect and understanding, which is not always a given with, the, um, with everyone, but you have to get there, so. The question was, what's coming in the future? I mean, I think we actually already live in the future. I mean, you, hello, we're here. Like, yeah. it's not like we're waiting for something to happen. Mm -hmm. It's all just waiting for you to do it, if anything. And if, you, and if you're not doing it, somebody else is going to do it, and you're going to feel stupid later. So <laughs> just do it. Thanks. Kagan, you get to jump in. Yeah, I was just going to say Bree's 100% right. I mean, you just do things. Like, it's, it's that simple. I mean, every day I get up and I do things that I have no idea how to do. And, like, I'm like, I need a website. Let's design a website. Oh, I'm going to go talk to investors. Let's pitch investors. Oh, we need to, like, travel around and, like, meet all these people and speak at events. That sounds good. Okay, now we're going to get back and, like, edit this video. Sure. Um, and you just keep doing things. And you have no idea. And you find people. And you talk to people to know how to do those things. And you ask more questions. And, and you meet more people that are awesome. And eventually the skill sets grow. And the web grows. And the knowledge base grows. Um, but this idea that, like, you're not doing it alone. And, like, you know, beyond, like, the people around your circle. But, like, the fact that the internet is in front of you. And, like, literally, if you don't know how to do something, you know, you just go online and you Google and you find out how to do that thing or find somebody that knows how to teach you how to do that thing. I mean, there's really no excuse. The idea that, that you know, I, I think as he was saying, you know, that you would just sort of like sit at home and go through this like regular existence and not try things or not be curious or not want to build things or make things, even if you have no clue how to do them. I mean, I'm like now developing an algorithm. I'm working with people that are developing an algorithm to custom generate, you know, 3D printed parts. I don't know how to do that. I have no idea. These people are so much smarter than me. Um, but the fact that, like, you know, we've brought together this team of people that are amazing and, like, have these crazy skill sets, um, you know, in a way that I think couldn't have existed previously or certainly, like, would have been a lot more difficult um, has been made possible and is driving this future, um, I think is pretty incredible. Got you. Gabrielle, you look like you want to jump in. I was going to also jump in there, but then I've got a question. Yeah. Um, uh, well, anyway, I, yeah, there were a few things I thought of. The, uh, one is um, at ITP, I feel like the, what, the, really what I came out with was learning how to learn or learning how to Google. <laughs> like, Google. So, yes. <laughs> so learning how to learn is not learning how to Google. That's a change. That's a very important skill. But yeah, that it's possible to learn and, and, um, or possible to learn a lot of things. And uh, just That's being on the ship that I was on, for, I mean, I, I, I'm sort of like techie and uh, creative, but never really was around business and never really would have envisioned myself doing like pitches, uh, like starting companies, like uh, whatever it is from like all the legal admin, et cetera. So, but it's all coming and is possible and that's, yeah, sort of you need to start a company. Okay, start a company. You need to uh, start a nonprofit. Okay, start a, whatever it is, yeah. Just jump right in. Do Just it. jump right in gotcha. and do it. Gotcha. Um, when we were doing the prep for this call, I asked that question about, you know, what's the greatest obstacle? What's one thing you'd like to change right now? You think that would, 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 that, would um, uh, that, that would pave the way for this new world? And Bree, you had a great response, which was? I don't remember. Oh, I mean, come on, you said blow up all the schools. <laughs> what's that? Blow up all the schools, So it's I interesting. I, I'm actually, I'm working on this problem right now of how do we make <laughs> education relevant? How do we make, for, K, for specifically K-12? Uh, how many of you survived without dropping out? A few of you. Okay. How many of you? How many of you either dropped out or just, if, looking back on it, it would have been so much better if you had just bailed. <laughs> right? Okay. I want to hang out with all of you, um, because it's one of those things where, um, unless, I mean, I was, I, I mean, I dropped out. Of, I'm kind of weird because I was a, I was a school teacher, so I was in, I was part of the system, but I also dropped out of seventh grade, so. Um, very happily. Uh, so it's one of those things where I think that, you know, how many of you had, are, you, this is a pretty young audience, how many of you had shop class in your history? Okay, that's gone now. That does not exist anymore. No, but it, none of the young, a very small amount of young people in very special cases get to actually touch things with their hands and get that sense of creativity that you got when you completed something. And um, that's kind of one of the problems that I'm kind of, I'm just going to fix that. 
I'm on that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Kagan, how about you? Any when you think about one thing that could change that would pave the way for this doer maker, explorer, hands on creative culture or that that permissiveness that I think is one of the things obviously that's missing in the in the school system with kids and, and we've gotten to such a fear based culture, but what would that be? Yeah, I think close. I, I, uh, I, I would probably say access to the technology, but also I would say parents and parents' view of the technology and just awareness of what's actually going on. You know, I, I wonder a lot of times, you know, had I been growing up now, like, you know, what would I be learning in school? And like, would I like, probably I'd like know how to code and I would have like dropped out of like eighth grade and like started a company and like maybe, I don't know, uh, or maybe like I would have been like, you know, go to go do your math homework. I'm not sure. Um, but but I, I think a lot of it has to come from the family and the have family has to be supportive of that. And it gets me really excited, you know, when I look on Twitter and, you know, I, I see, you know, people that I know, parents that I know um, that are pushing their kids in this direction and talking about, like, getting them maker bots and, you know, putting them, like, into, like, hacker classes and teaching them how to, like, you know, code and wire things. And, and that's really exciting. Um, but I, I think also that that's a really small bubble that I'm surrounded with and, like, happens to be in my Twitter feed. And when you look at, like, the larger, you know, U.S., that's not happening. Um, and I, I think it has to move beyond, you know, sort of, like, these, you know, localized cities and urban, you know, changes that we're having, you know, to the broader whole. And, and I think we're quite a ways off from doing that. And how close do you equate the, um, this, the, the maker movement and DIY movement with a sort of artist sensibility? Is it, does it map almost completely? Is it the same sensibility with a different manifestation? You know, I, I think that uh, if there's one thing that's, that, I mean, I think artists are a real diverse group. I don't think you can really put them in a box. Into, like at all, but like curiosity is probably the thing that helps make a, a, and and being able to work with other people. I mean, mm -hmm. my experience as a failed artist was that I didn't make the connections with the people who would buy my art, mm -hmm. and I had created this whole like you know I'd, I'd gone into the cult of exclusive beauty where I was going to just create these small amount of things and so they would have lots of value and that didn't work for me. I ended up wanting to just make lots of things for lots of people, so it was a different kind of way to think. Um, and so kind of cult of beauty, cult of sharing, cult of done, kind of, I think making, you know, there's the original like Maker's Manifesto, which is basically like use screwdrivers <laughs> and open things up. Those are your tools. I think, I, just to comment on that really quickly, I think I actually kind of lucked out because I'm like thinking back to like when I was a kid and we always had a wood shop in our garage and like I was like building stuff with my dad and like I remember when he like, I don't know, like drilled through his hand and I had to go to the hospital, but like things like this and like we were always making things um, and that's probably why I ended up being like, I want to make things and unfortunately didn't get the gene that actually, you know, allowed me to be able to do it, um, but, uh, but then there were printers. <laughs> Gabriella, because you really started as an artist. Because what? Well, your, your artistry. Yeah. Fusing those two together, how do you? I mean, I, I think it's a hard question because there are a lot of ways to be critical about what is an artist and what is a maker and what is a maker who then turns things into a company. And I guess, I mean, I have transitioned back and forth. Yeah, it's quite different. Back and forth between being an artist and being an entrepreneur and maybe probably in my life will go back and forth between being both, I think, um, as well as thinking about my art as how it can it make money as well, so also. So I think that, but the, the, for me, the sentiment to just work, like you said, just to work, just to make something, have an interest and want to explore that and really work hands on to explore that, I find that that I do see as ubiquitous amongst uh, somebody who wants to make something, develop it into a company, but also an artist who wants to explore and do R&D and whatever it is that is of interest. So what do you think that we could, we could learn here the, in, the, in the greater group in terms of the, the uh, art and, and, and uh, software and the maker movement? How are they different? How are they similar? How can we, how can we create something? So you know, I, I'm amazed at the incredible willing, willingness of artists to share. I'm amazed at the singular struggle around resources. And the DIY, it's interesting because the resources seem to, you, you seem to be able to collaborate in ways that looks like the resources may come to you more easily. So is there something you can do with that that might map out into, um, into the artist community? You know, the thing that um, I think that, so I, I don't know, um, but <laughs> the thing that I would say um, is I think that there's one of the things that you're going to see that's kind of in common of uh, 
that, I mean, DIY is very strong, and, it, and it's really a very powerful, and there's a lot of uh, really R&D going on at a, a very individual level in the world right now. There's the tools, the resources, the software, the electronics to be able to make stuff. You, know, you want to make a boat, sails around the world, <laughs> collects samples of things, measures radiation. You, did, you figured that out. Like, and there's enough modules that you could probably get a good chunk of it going until you realize that those modulars aren't perfect and you have to do them from scratch. But you can get pretty far. You can kind of like cheat yourself and say like, oh yeah, I mean, this is going to be easy. And then by the time it's not easy, you're too far in, right? <laughs> so there's... <laughs> um, and then you have to figure it out. Uh, but I think that um, there's something about having a mission or a cause that's, that, that's very helpful. I mean, that's part of what makes in the spirit of MakerBot, we, you know, we're, gonna, we're looking for partners to explore how to make education relevant, and that's one of our missions. And it's kind of, in, it's been in our DNA for a long time, and we're, uh, we're thinking about how to make that really explicit and looking for people to work with and collaborate with. And so I think, and you know, you're on a mission, you start out, it's interesting the whole BP spill, the um, Deepwater Horizon, we, and the Thingiverse community did something interesting around there, where they were like, we wanna fix this, we're smart engineers, let's collaborate, let's do it. And then they went to go get the information and it wasn't there. They didn't know what the pipe was made out of, how wide it was, what the throughput was, what attach points there were. And so they actually spent, put, put, you know, passed the hat around, raised a couple thousand dollars. But it wasn't a couple thousand dollars for the person who could solve the problem. It was a couple thousand dollars for the person who could, try and, who could infiltrate the organization and get any information <laughs> about the problem so they could solve it. And um, that kind of like, that's cool stuff. Yeah. Like, then you get into like, okay, how, what are we gonna do together to make a difference, you know? My family's got this project where we're restoring old growth forest, to, uh, restoring forest to old growth. It turns out, with all the invasive species, it just doesn't work to just let it sit there. So, it's turning out to be a crap ton of work. Mm -hmm. And it'll take a thousand years before we're done, and we're not gonna live that long, so this is a weird project. Um, Speaking of time frames. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that, that that's exactly right. Speaking of time frames, um, talk about talk about Thingverse because you mentioned it, but I don't know that people necessarily know what it is, and it begins this body of knowledge that you're building on. I think so much of the the DIY and the maker movement is about yeah. building on previous bodies of knowledge. I mean, it's interesting. Um, a Thingverse is Thingverse. a place where people share their digital designs and download other people's digital designs, and and we started an hour on a Saturday, something we we called it Resistor Saturday Spaz, where we which probably an inappropriate word, but um, we basically wanted to try it out and see if it would, if we could get something off the ground. And an hour later, we were like, this is pretty good. Let's do another hour on this. And then the next thing you know, about a month later, it was actually up and running. And the first year, we probably, we probably, the <laughs> main ones who used it, there were probably less than 100 users in the first year. And now there's like, uh, thou you know, thousands of things a week. It's like absurd. Um, that there's things that you can make, there's like hundreds of things you can make today that are co contributed from the greater community that you couldn't make yesterday, which just is, is there's this just explosion of creativity in the 3D modeling space. It, uh, we set up the site mostly for laser cut models, but it kind of got overtaken by 3D printing when we started running that, that gig. Um, but it's just wonderful what people are willing to share out there. And it's interesting, for many projects, it really works to be absurdly open. If you don't have to make a living on it or you can find a way to get sponsored, you know, I, I, when I was working for Make, everything was like absurdly open. When we started MakeAbout, it was absurdly open. Mm. Um, and you can actually get really far by putting it out there and letting other people build on it. When you start a business, eventually you get knocked off and gets made in places where the people get paid a dollar. And, and it doesn't really work as a long-term, it didn't work for as a long-term business model for, other, for us, although I know there are a bunch of other people trying it, but it's, we still, our core value is about sharing and we create Thingiverse and we share tons of stuff on there. And, and people, other people do it too. Tegan, how about you in terms of the body of knowledge and, and oh, yeah. how you're taking that with your new company too? Absolutely. Well, I actually, I wanted to comment on that. Um, you know, I think one of the things that's so amazing, um, you know, about Thingiverse or about Shapeways or about, um, yeah, what's the other one? That, Grabcad um, or all, all of these online platforms that are starting to pop up, which is basically like online file sharing, you know, whether those are free or whether they're paid for, or there's some sort of like new revenue model. I think we're all sort of still trying to figure out like what that model is. Um, but the idea that we're moving from, you know, this, this past where, you know, you had these objects and they were like made, you know, in some weird far off place and they were 
were expensive and you bought them at the store to like this new future where like it's very collaborative and it's very digital and it's very online and like nothing's made until somebody actually wants it. That's pretty amazing. Um, nothing is made until you actually want it. I mean, if you think about like all the distribution warehouses, they're scattered across the entire US. I think about this all the time in relation to insoles, actually. Like if you think about like the Dr. Scholl's warehouses and like the size six and seven and eight and nine and 10 and like all these styles and weird colors that like nobody ever wanted, just like sitting there full of stuff that nobody's ever gonna buy. Like the idea that we could get rid, rid of that and like platforms like like Thingiverse, like Shapeways, you know, any of these like are changing that, um, I, I think is amazing and really like starts to craft a new kind of future. Um, you know, and it's a future, you know, that, that, you know, makes it so that things don't have to be made in advance, but it's also a future that makes it so, you know, going back to your economic model question, um, anybody can start a company that makes things. And that's also really cool. Um, you know, literally, like, you you make something on your computer for free and probably some open source, you know, software for free. Um, and then you upload it for free. And then it sits on a website somewhere for free. And then somebody downloads it and makes it. And, like, that whole cycle is totally, like, shared and free. Um, is really, like, a new kind of economy and a new kind of business, you know, regardless of whether, you know, you stay in the maker category or you decide to monetize it. Um, it's a very new structure in, in how we interact and, and how we work together. So... And now there's some places that are easier than others to do this. Obviously, New York's an easy place. There's certain, there's, are you seeing interesting places where maker culture is raising? I mean, certainly in Africa, I know, in, the, in Kenya, that, that there's cultures around having to salvage everything and having to rework it and remake it. Gabrielle, you're shy. Sh yeah. We keep sharing yeah. this. Yeah. this <laughs> Um, a couple things come to mind. Uh, the three, actually. Um, let's see if I remember them all. <laughs> One is just uh, globally, the places that I've been working and that we've been developing Prote, for, for example, last summer we spent time in tech shop in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And there were other companies that were spawning from there, like Open ROV, mm -hmm. which is an, under awesome. an open source underwater that's awesome. robot that's tethered and so, so they were just starting, and they had just finished their Kickstarter. They they got Kickstarter money. They were putting together. Uh, I can't remember how many of these open source robots that they were shipping out. So that's where their company began. And Tech Shop is this. It's a. It's. There are a lot of ways to describe it, but it's a place where it allows people to come and fabricate. So really, these like fab labs, maker shops, uh, and places where people could come together and use tools that they might have not used, or they could use tools for both building mm -hmm. but also coding um, and fabrication. I think that those places that are sprouting up globally are really cool. And so Prote decided to make the company, or at least start doing stuff on the line in Shenzhen, mm -hmm. uh, in China. So for us, when we passed through there, Cesar and we were, we were super excited about, okay, this is actually one big giant hackerspace <laughs> because it was, all the tools were accessible at way less of a price than, and, and the living situation was, I mean, basically it was cheaper and more accessible and the manufacturing was right there. So that's one place where it's just accelerating the pace of innovation and people are coming from all over now to really start companies there. Um, the uh, another thing came to mind that uh, about Africa that you mentioned. We we visited a uh, sort of incubator in South Africa that's called R Labs, and they were incubating people who were gang members or ex drug addicts. And that uh, that wasn't really accelerating innovation more than I've ever seen, but it was really bringing people who had passion for working hands on to a place where they were able to do that for the first time, and they they're actually generating really cool stuff. So these places where people could work collaboratively. Um, I think are generating a lot of new businesses. Excellent. I think we've got time for, certainly time for questions from the audience, and if you want to line up and, and uh, we have the, the mic set up, we'd love to entertain those questions. Um, Bree, any places you've seen that you love that are uh, um, maker, place making of the maker culture or the, what, the, what you need in an ecosystem or what the sort of primordial ooze is to help to accelerate the, a maker culture? I mean, I got started because I had a group. I was part of a group in Seattle called uh, Hackerbot Labs, and then I got really inspired by the CCC in Germany, which is the Chaos Computer Club. Where they, in Germany, they kind of nailed it. Like, you can get a checking account if you just have three people and you have a good club name. Nice. And uh, here, you have to start an LLC. Um, so it's a little bit different. We've got a question though. This yep. is going to be the good Absolutely. part. Absolutely. Jump in. Hi. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Speaking um, to the, into the mic. Oh. So. Hi, thanks so much for your panel and your interesting um, ways of going about um, becoming a maker. 
Um, I read a New York Times article, I think it was New York Times, it was about um, this guy 3D printed his food. Mm. Did y'all read that? Anyway, it was great. And um, I had two comments, or two questions more or less. Um, have you, could we revolutionize the recycling industry in this way? Like, could we print, you know, 3D print all the stuff that we throw away and, and with recycling materials? Um, and also, the, the second question is, there's such a high threshold in this, at least in this country or in our culture, of making as opposed to sitting back and receiving. Like, let me go buy something as opposed to making it. And how, how do you think of ways to overcome, uh, teach motivation, teach this, this maker mentality? Who wants to start with? So I think the 3D printer question, I'll take that one. The answer is yes. <laughs> um, what was Done. the other one? <laughs> I'll let somebody else take the other one. Uh, the threshold of motivation and um, making. Well, recycling. Oh, recycling. Can't we play with yeah, that? Recycling. Okay, you want to do so. The so there's um, material science problems with recycling things that are when you recycle things, um, you generally get uh, dirt in them because people are dirty, and um, so when you want to recycle things, you have to either clean them or you have to. In our case, it's a matter about having a no, you you lose resolution because you have to go to a larger nozzle size so that the dust and gunk that gets on things when they're out in the world when you recycle them doesn't jam up your nozzle. That's sort of the technical answer is like, yes, just lower resolution because um, recycled stuff has gunk in it. And it, that causes other problems as well. But for the most part, it's really, it's, it, it's coming. It just requires more, more global adoption. Um, th this doesn't touch on 3D printing necessarily, but I'm working a little bit with a guy based in Washington, and he is, I, uh, basically he makes kayaks, and he's making, uh, the kayaks that he makes, they're one of the, uh, they prolifer it's like one of the biggest kayak companies that sells in, in the U.S., I can't remember the name offhand, but he is working with, a, a trying to get a recycled material that could um, take trash from the ocean, but not discard the waste. So like it, baby diapers and mm. crap also. So it basically could be made it, with this plastic. And he gave me a business card. And it's, it's just a ton of crap and plastic together. So there are people working on this. And, and the cool part about it is that it could be vacuum formed and it might be able to be 3D printed. So people are definitely working on using trash to make plastics that will be more usable. You know, on the boats thing, I, I'm, there's actually a group at the University of Washington that um, there's a there's a competition in Seattle where you're it's called the uh, Milk Jug Derby, <laughs> and you have to make a, a boat out of milk containers. And this a really uh, op awesome group at, at the University of Washington, they sort of were like, oh yeah, and then they got a <laughs> bunch of milk containers that are made out of HDPE, which yep. is a thermoplastic, and they put them in blenders. They cut them up, put them in blenders, and um, it was actually, there's some, uh, there were issues around actually getting the plastic. When, when you get recycled, sometimes when things are made, they aren't made with the things that people say they're making them with, which is a problem. But they actually extruded and made their own 3D printed boat. And they totally got disqualified because the judges did not understand. Like it, it was, they, 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 like, they won, but they sort of like, it was one of those like, wait a second. <laughs> And so it's kind of like when you like uh, when you win something by changing the rules. I think um, this is the best way. <laughs> yeah, and 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 uh, I, I I believe they actually did win. I'd have to look it up, but it was super awesome. So there's a there's a whole frontier there for people to explore, reuse, recycle as well. What was your second question? Um, it was about raising the or lowering the threshold of learning, of uh. motivating. And you know, I think that's about storytelling. I think, I mean, that's one of the, I mean, it's interesting. We're going to, with 3D printing, we, when we started, nobody knew what it was because it was an industrial application. And we'd go, like, we made 3D printers, and people would look at us like, <laughs> you make what? Like, and, you know, I might as well have said, uh, we make teleporters, which we kind of do, but it's, um, it's it, people didn't get it. Now, I think we hit the point where everybody at least knows about 3D printing. And how many, buddy, how many people know somebody or know that they could get access to a 3D printer, just out of curiosity? Nice. Oh, wow. Nice. Oh, that makes me really happy. That's the most people in a room I've ever seen raise their hand to that question. <laughs> OK, so we're here. Like, gotcha. We've got one right over here. Yeah. Question, sir. Yeah. Um, 
So, um, slightly provocative question, you know, in my usual fashion. So, um, I was kind of, I wasn't counting, but you guys probably use the word do, do it, let's do it, about 600 panel, 600 times on your panel, and I can see how there are many positive things about it, uh, but you haven't used the word think once. Even, this, even like I start to want, and, okay. Overrated. Right, yeah, yeah, well, that's exactly what you would say, right? And when it makes me start wondering, you know, like all these associations, America, pragmatism, kind of do it yourself, you know, Europe sitting in cafe, thinking, not doing anything. But I guess I think we need to defend thinking a little bit, but, and before we had maker movements, you know, and uh, 3D printers, we had things called universities, which are all fully dysfunctional machines, but at their best, we are, with, we are with amazing kind of labs for thinking. We also had reading groups. And, uh, you know, I think we need to have a balance. Um, so what would you say to that? <laughs> well, that's an excellent point. I think you're onto something. Um, I think there's, it's interesting. There's actually two, I've thought about this a lot, and there's, there's Two ways to innovation, and or or you can there's kind of you can you can you can go in between. One of them is you just do, and you don't need as much thinking. You know, when we started MakerBot, we kind of joked that if we were engineers, we'd still be working on the prototype. Um, and so uh, there is something to doing in it. You can actually do a lot of engineering. I think we can all speak to this of just trying it and then going, oh, well. Why didn't I know this before? Because you didn't know it. But then once you do it, you know it. And you can iterate. And the iteration is a way to engineering. You can also be, if it, once you have experience, or if you are somebody with experience, or if you have some thinking, you can, you can actually think ahead. One of the downsides of thinking ahead is you usually th uh, overthink it, and you make something that's too expensive, oh, uh, way higher tolerances than you needed, and, and you overshoot. So there's, I think that there's kind of the best ending solution, and you can start on either side, is to, is to do one where you're both doing and thinking. No, just, just very briefly, but you know, the reason you can do because somebody thought before, right? Because there are things like chips and boards and computers, so somebody had to do theoretical physics. So maybe or they the reason, did it. They didn't yeah. necessarily have to think about it. There are people really? who just do things. <laughs> I mean, like Einstein right. just did it. Like, like, like Jerry Ellsworth. <laughs> Oh yeah, I was gonna say it's interesting because I have this conversation a lot with one of our engineers, um, and and he's always coming to me and he's like, oh, I have this this research paper, I'm doing this research, and what do you think about these things? And I have these theories, and I'm like, well, have you tried it? Like, go try it and tell me if it works. If it works, that's great. Then you can try more in this direction. If it doesn't work, then you can stop looking at that because you've already spent like four hours doing this thing, and like try something else. And he literally like looks back at me with this look on his face like. Really? Really? Um, and, you know, I think now he's been with the company for, yeah, maybe like a month and a half, and now he's just totally used to it. And he's like, oh, yeah, well, I tried that, and I tried that, and this worked, and this didn't work. So I think it's a combination. You know, I, I think it's partially, like, learning and, and researching, but it's also being able to, like, really quickly apply that and really quickly deduce, like, okay, this makes sense, this doesn't make sense, like, what is rational, how could this apply to, like, what I'm doing, and, and how do I implement that really fast to just try it out and, like, rapidly iterate? Anything for you, Gabrielle, this last comment? Sure, very last comment. Um, the, the, by just doing it, I've definitely wasted time and have gotten into the same thing that you said. The very last thing that I thought of when he said was perhaps the dif difference between like art and just making. I might regret saying this, but maybe that uh, you do have to think and stop and conceptualize to do art rather than just making. So that might be one difference I see personally. Okay. Well, thank you so much for all of you.